All right, this is my third day under the weather, so I'm going to make a quick video this morning, and uh, this will be more a tech powwow about good design versus bad design. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is, is thinking about, does my design make sense? It, if I had to explain it to someone else, does it make sense? A lot of SQL Server developers and DBAs like to say the word, it depends, um, or words, I should say, it depends. And they like to say that um, sometimes because it's true. Sometimes it's a cop-out for laziness. Or sometimes it's a cop-out for trying to make themselves look smarter than they actually are. It depends is does not mean that whatever you're doing can only make sense to you and nobody else. Because what happens when you're no longer in the picture? I mean, it could be a good thing or a bad thing, but the bottom line is people do move on, right? If only one person can solve every problem, then that person can never leave. And since humans don't live forever, that's a problem, okay? Think in high, low, middle designs, or you know, you could think of uh, you know, the, the, the surveys where you have five extremely happy, happy, neutral, etc. you know, five broad designs, um, and follow the standard rule set um, that's defined in an easier manner than, you know, well, this one exception. Because keep this in mind, when it comes to large environments and exceptions, every exception that you add may not make sense to other people. Every exception that you add needs to be documented. If you're not documenting it, man, what's going to happen when you leave and nobody knows why you did something, okay? Remember, too, that as these aggregate, this becomes, documenting becomes a full-time job. You got to document every exception to the rule, okay? Each exception is going to require a minimum of one hour of work per week, meaning every exception makes more work. Let me explain what I mean by that. In the long run, it may seem like, well, we're going to make this one exception for this configuration database, no big deal. But when you consider the fact that you're going to have to then explain that to someone else, if there's an issue with that, you're going to have to then discuss and prove your point with all the meetings that people have. When you add up all of the different things that you have to do over the long run, it's a, a one hour per week for every exception you create. Whereas if you follow a model and you say high, low, middle, or you know very high, high, um, middle, low, very low model, then it's just a matter of, oh, I can look at um, the way things are configured and I can see that this is following that low model or this is following that high model or this is following that middle model, right? If that's not built, if it's not designed that way, then you're going to have a problem. I'll give you a couple examples of this. Um, in a couple of the, the, the environments I've been in, most DBAs follow a standard naming convention for data and log files. Uh, the data file is generally data file, and the log file is generally log file underscore log. I mean, it, it makes it makes backing up or storing easy. It makes it makes a lot of things easy because you can take that assumption. Oh, but the big environments. There's something about big environments, and somebody decides to get creative, and they're like, "Oh, but I really want to call this one data file, you know, data file my data file." What do you think that's going to do in the long run? Why was this called that way? So how are, how are we going to fix that without ha having no outage, right? It's just stupid. It's absolutely stupid. I worked with one DBA who his, his policy was you had to follow a naming convention, and if you didn't follow it, he dropped all your objects. Didn't care. It's like you just have to redesign all of it. And I loved his policy. I was like, I just love that. He's like, I'm not going to sit there and babysit y'all. You're going to follow the naming convention or you're going to lose everything. And so he had a PowerShell script that would just loop through every database and anything that didn't follow the naming convention, if it was a view, it had to follow the view naming convention. If it was a procedure, it had to follow the procedure, everything. Like if it didn't follow his standards, it got dropped. <laughs> and I love that guy. He was so awesome because he was like, I'm not going to let you do these things. And uh, if you if you allow that, if you allow people uh, to, to create exceptions, it starts to become a full-time job in and of itself. And then you end up losing all kinds of time because someone, th they thought they were being clever. They're not, um, uh, but they thought they were being clever. A good example of this, and I'll show a, a SQL Server example here, is, uh, was a situation in which uh, there was a source table that was being replicated downstream uh, to the same database to two different tables. So the source table is the same but it's going to two different tables in the same database. Many of you who've done transactional replication see the immediate problem. I'll give you a hint. Think about the procedures behind the scenes. 
because the difference between A and B was A had a different column set than B did. Mm, think about that. And you'll be like, oh yeah, that's going to be a problem, right? Well, does it even make any sense to replicate um, a source table to two different tables that have different column sets from the same source table in the same database? It's like, well, because one application points at one table and one application points at the other. And so let's bring up SQL Server here. Well, what you, what you could easily do, I have this table right here, and in this table, GLD, I have a date, open, high, low, close, volume, adjusted close, but I can have a view, gold, open, see, and it just has two columns, and I can have a view, gold, volume, and you see it has three. And these columns, except for date, are different than these columns, right? So look at what I can do with a view. I could easily have, imagine that the source was the, the destination database and table. I could have A and B views built off that table. There's no reason why I would have to need to be replicating uh, the same data twice. And plus, that's just more work. you got got 100 million records. Why in the world would you be replicating that to two different tables plus generating all kinds of errors? Because, of course, it's using um, the same uh, stored procedures behind the scenes. It's just poor design. So this is what I mean. Does your design make sense? When someone comes and they critique your design, and for the record, I've had bad design. People have critiqued it, and I'm like, that's right. That's a good problem. I have to come back to the drawing board. I proposed a solution. Um, what was it, a couple weeks ago, and somebody brought up a good challenge to it. And so I had to go back and think and came up with another solution that worked. But the thing is, is that you don't get defensive. You just sit there and say, you're right, that doesn't make any sense. Let's do it this way, right? Um, and this was a good example. Naming is a great example. There's no excuse to be coming up with your own little creative names. Follow a standard. And um, from from the beginning, uh, you know, I think that what the, the, the DBA that I worked with, dropping objects that don't follow the standard is a great idea. Another one, for instance, is install the latest service pack when you uh, create a server. There's no reason why not to. Because, oh, I forgot to do that. Now we need to take it offline and do that. It's just dumb. So these are just some things when you think about overall designing well versus designing poorly. And is your design going to make sense to someone else? Okay. And if it's not, then you need to go back to the drawing board until it does.